Welcome to the first ever edition of Jet Prop Rotor. I am Jake Donovan. Along with Sean Donovan. And we are a father-son team who travels around the country interviewing veterans. On this interview, we traveled down to Woburn, Mass to interview a World War II veteran by the name of Al Audet. Al was a radio man on a B-17, part of a 10-man crew, and his crew would often go over and bomb Germany, deep into Germany actually, and about halfway through his mission total of 25 missions, something very unfortunate happened to him and his crew. And you're going to have to watch this video to see what happened. Ugh. Very cold. Yeah, chilly. The first mission was Kiel submarine pens in Kiel. A seven and a half hour flight, uh, no escort, and uh, we spent about uh, oh, two or three hours trying to find the target. You go through the fog and things of that nature to overcome some of the uh, weather conditions. The weather conditions in England was very bad, and over the continent it was even worse. But we did uh, bomb, drop our bombs, and according to submarine pens, they were buried in 10 or 20 feet of concrete, which was very, very hard to penetrate. And we went there two or three times, but my first one was the Kiel submarine pens. After that, we had different mention, missions and uh, went to uh, 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 Cologne in uh, Germany. Uh, one of our missions there was to, for the ammunition factories and uh, uh, subsequently other, other missions uh, were at different targets. Uh, I flew with the same crew most of the most of my missions, uh, and on the uh, 13th, we were required to fly 25 missions, and then be sent home. And uh, so I got to 13th mission, and I figured I was halfway there, so I figured well, I don't have too much time to to go. So on the 14th mission which is the mission that we were shot down on, at the uh, V-2 rocket launching pads. Uh, we went in there at about 12,000 feet. Cloud cover was really thick, couldn't find the target. So the lead pilot took us around and went down to 8,000 feet. Then we got a little bit better view of the target. And uh, of course, this gave the ground people uh, more time to set their guns, and that's when we got lost our engines. The flak hit us so hard that we lost two engines, and the third engine was feathering so bad it had to be feathered. Uh, after we uh, asked to, to bail out, we decided we couldn't, bail, we didn't want to bail out. Pilot said, well, we'll try and make landfall to England and we got a light in the ship, so we had to throw everything out of the plane to lighten the ship. The first things we threw out were the parachutes. We didn't want to, we didn't want to fly down and get, get picked up by Germans and all of that stuff, so we, we kept the par we threw the parachutes out, threw the guns out, ammunition, radio equipment, as much as we could to lighten the plane. And so the pilot says, we're going to prepare for ditching. So then all the guys got into the radio compartment and we leaned against the bulkhead and that was the position you would take. The bombardier and the navigator were against the wall and then all the other guys were kneeling or sitting in front of them. When we hit the water at 120 miles an hour, and hit the water, you get two shocks. The first shock, you hit the water, and then the, the tail snapped. The tail snapped off the plane because it was riddled with uh, flak and all of that stuff. And so I, after I, my last, the last guy went out, I locked the key down and kept the signal going. And then I rushed out and I had to get out on the wing. Well, I was the last man out, so. I got on the wing and the, the raft is around the side of the plane. So I went to reach 
the raft, but I walked off the off the wing and went down into the water, and I paddled my way into the into the raft. By this time, the uh, rescue boat was on the way to the raft, and when they picked me up and put me in the raft, I was the first man to go on the raft, on the, on the boat, and my hands went on the ladder, and they froze, it was so cold. The water was probably 40 degrees or something like that in the English Channel. It was February 28, 1944. After we were rescued, they took us to uh, Dunnegan, and they took us to the hospital, and they put us they kept us overnight to uh, recuperate. The engineer says, oh, we got an extra day. So we stayed an extra day. So we were listed as AWOL. So when we got back to camp, we were listed as AWOL, and we could have been shot for deser uh, uh, de desertion, failure to face the enemy. Uh, as far as the other missions, uh, the, other, the other missions, I shouldn't say they were routine, but they were hazardous. And you were always, the thing that scared me the most was the flak. The fighters didn't bother me at all because I never saw them. I was in a radio compartment. I was blinded by everything. I had a little window on the side and I had an open hatch on the top. Well, by the time they flew over me, they were gone. I was the only guy that could shoot the tail off a of off a B-17 because there was no control on my gun. All the others had cutoffs, automatic cutoffs, like the waist guns. They could be cut off. The tail, the bomb, uh, the ball turret gunner, the top turret gunner, could be cut off and all that. So they were safe. Uh, I think our tail gunner and uh, our top gunner got two ME 109s and uh, so that's the only two that we got. Uh, but the, uh, we were always threatened by fires. But the thing that scared me was the flak. And I would sometimes lay down on the, on the, um, on the uh, flak suits. I'd lay down on the floor of the plane. I would lay there listen to the radio and all of that stuff. And so that, that was my routine uh, as a radio gunner, except when we were in emergency situations. Then I would be in my, in my position in the thing. Uh, we were all assigned to different planes uh, as, as the uh, memorandum dictates. I have. The uh, difficult part of the whole thing was maintaining uh, radio silence as long as we could, communications as good as, good as we could, and uh, our eyes open as much as we could see. Uh, our radio compartment was, was uh, completely closed for me. It, it was the safest place on, place on the plane. And as a result, I never got, never got hurt. As a matter of fact, I don't think I ever saw uh, a dead person come off my plane. Or even when we landed, they never took us where the planes had, had casualties. We never saw them. They would be taken off before we got to debriefing. The debriefing took about a, an hour or so where everybody told their story. Uh, some were uh, unbelievable. Some of them were a little tall tales and all of that, but you had to, it had to be screened by the, uh, by the uh, interviewing officers. And they would take all that information and document it, put it in for future reference to the other guys that were going, probably to the same missions. We did go to the same missions over and over again. Uh, I went to Frankfurt, Germany. I went to Schweinfurt. I went to Regensburg. Uh, a lot of the major, uh, uh, the, uh, the marshalling yards, 
and uh, the uh, ammunition dumps. Uh, it was always it was always something to uh, look forward. To. Well, <laughs> can't say look forward to. It was our job, and that's what we did. Uh, I completed uh, 25 missions, uh, and I uh, 23 missions, and General Doolittle. I had no luck, no love for that guy. When he got to the, the, our base, he upped the thing from 25 to 30 missions. So now instead of two missions to do, I had seven to do. Now the worst five missions I had to do were the five that were tacked on to the 25 that I was supposed to go home on. So that's why I have no love for Doolittle. When I got to 30 missions, I got off the plane, went down, kissed the ground, and said, this is it. Well, that's all they did. They took us out and put us in tents aside, ready to go home.